So uh, my name is Nancy Marksbury. I am the director of digital learning at Cuca College. <laughs> Please come on in. Um, I'm uh, also an associate professor of humanities and fine arts. Sorry, assistant. I knew I would do that. <laughs> um, and begging Christine's uh, pardon, I would like to introduce our panelists okay. before we get started. So uh, Annie Almakinder is the Director of digital, digital Instruction and Technology. Laurel Hester is an Assistant Professor of Biology and Natural Sciences and Math. And Anid Bryant is the Director of our Digital Studies minor and Associate Professor of Communication Studies and Humanities and Fine Arts. So uh, just a broad overview of how we're going to proceed this morning is I want to first uh, set the context by describing our presentation last year at this conference, which uh, gave us lots of uh, enthusiasm and self-confidence. It was a great experience. <laughs> and uh, then I'm going to uh, describe where we went in the last year in our process. Um, and next, our, uh, Annie will describe how we've tried to leverage technology to measure our outcomes, and uh, Laurel and Anid will speak to us from the liberal arts uh, perspective on the process of mapping our outcomes. So, uh, last year's presentation, uh, we had uh, a rather large group here, and we brought uh, to this conference our uh, initiative, which was just uh, two semesters old at this time last year. And uh, we introduced faculty innovations, what we were doing in the classrooms to uh, demonstrate digital learning. And we also had a fresh set of uh, student learning outcomes that had been developed by the faculty. And so we laid that out for getting some feedback on that. Very positive experience. So uh, the initiative itself is uh, digital learning at QP College. Uh, we abbreviate it, and you may hear us say DL at KC. So what the initiative about is about is, and I'm hearing uh, various iterations from uh, Gina yesterday here at Myanmar and other institutions. So we're looking to create digital learners who are also critical thinkers who understand how digital tools work, both their limitations and their possibilities. And we're doing this on campus and in courses that are online and around the world at our uh, partner institutions in Asia. So uh, these are the broad uh, major topics of our student learning outcomes. I do have some copies if you're interested in uh, having a look. There. They're quite expansive. So we've got seven major topics, and we have uh, four to five uh, sub outcomes underneath uh, each major topic. And um, so uh, taking off from what we talked about last year, we had uh, additive components to the curriculum. Uh, which is encased in a digital studies minor. Uh, since then, we've also added a few more things. We now have an e-portfolio requirement for all of our students. Requirement is in um, quotes because it's still filtering through the faculty governance uh, mechanisms. And we also have uh, created a self-guided information literacy course online. Uh, we described last year the initiative as having uh, two thrusts, if you will, both additive and integrative. So on the integrative side, we have some uh, action groups. We have the Digital Learning at Cuca College Faculty Working Group, which is an ad hoc group that uh, came up with these learning outcomes. We have uh, representatives from each division as a, another group that's learning technology mentors who are more on the ground uh, communicating and liaising with IT 
the faculty and administration. And then we have digital action groups, which are collections of faculty uh, that are helping us guide how we do this infusion and integration. Uh, we've uh, worked out a lot of elbow grease in the process with uh, doing things to expand awareness of and engagement in, and those have been two weeks in uh, last semester, well, uh, fall semester one week, this semester one week, where we had faculty presentations, student activities, um, and then we also ran a digital learning seminar series that uh, featured faculty presentations to the community at large. Uh, so all this effort is helping us increase student enrollment and faculty engagement, but it is a very slow process. <laughs> um, I would add that, so what the uh, faculty working group has done is we have um, our mission has been to take those student learning outcomes and provide a mechanism for certifying other courses as having that DL component in it. And our goal is to infuse this across the curriculum. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and we're still working on a rubric. This is a rubric in process that we imagine uh, individual faculty, and I, we have copies of this to share, uh, that faculty will use to uh, demonstrate that their courses or course is exemplifying what digital learning is all about. So now I'm going to ask me to describe our minor. Right. So as Nancy mentioned, while we work to <coughs> infuse digital learning across our campus and working with colleagues across all divisions to find ways to integrate the digital learning, student learning outcomes into their courses, we decided that it would be a good idea to create a minor that neatly situated itself within these goals. Um, so the minor, which launched in fall 2014, is called the Digital Studies Minor. It's a six course sequence, so um, it's an 18 credit sequence. And the minor itself, the goal of the minor is to expand digital literacy. It's to introduce fundamentals of coding. It's to encourage them to find ways to gather meaning and thoughtful narratives from data. We are also, um, the, probably the most important part about the minor is that it allows them to enhance and integrate what they're already doing in their course by using those digital skills and using digital technology. Uh, what we're finding is that uh, enrollment is going up. And um, I'm actually very excited to announce that this year, just in 10 days or so, we graduate our first student with a digital studies minor. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit about how that sort of shakes out. Obviously, it's a slow process, right? And as I mentioned, we're graduating our first student with a digital studies minor. And so this student would have taken you know, all of these courses, you know, including the capstone, which we, Nancy and I just finished working with him on. But you'll find that the enrollment in the first course of the series, of the sequence, is really high. And we put this at a 100 level course to encourage freshmen to take that in their, you know, in their first year. And that way we know that they're getting that foundation, um, no matter what they decide to do, if they decide to you know, go in a different direction. And so now I'd like to hand it off to Annie, who's going to talk about how we are mapping these student learning outcomes throughout our curriculum. My name is Annie Almakinder, and I'm the Director of Digital Instruction and Technology at QCAT. And one of my roles is the Learning Management System. So I am the Moodle Administrator. So this gave me a chance as an instructor and an administrator and a, a, a understanding how curriculum is designed to map our courses to our outcomes. So we, this began a great conversation with a group of people. How should we link our courses? What should we link? Should we link our quizzes, assignments, discussion posts, forums? How can we assess uh, all of our information in our courses? And then the other piece was we decided to look at uh, learning opportunities rather than student achievement because 
we all realized that there were so many ways that we were leveraging Moodle. Some were using the quizzes, some were using rubrics, checklists. We were using lots of ways to grade, and we're not uniform across the board. Probably will never be uniform across the board, and that's okay. So instead of <coughs> having curriculum, so our faculty was able to track five courses. Thank you. This is the big picture. I'm going to break this down for you. But what we see here is the light color is the fall 2015, and the dark color is spring. And these are the objectives that I handed out on that on that page. So you can kind of see where we're going. First of all. We were able to track assignments and content, and one of the things that we were able to do was go back and retro apply outcomes to our fall courses. So we had to kind of decide, you know, where does video editing with music and photos go in this scheme? Where where should beginning HTML go, advanced HTML go? So uh, it was a great opportunity for reflection. A couple of things that we found. Can you go to the next one? Mm -hmm. Uh, we can use this data, I kind of broke it into smaller pieces so you could see it. We can use data to see where we have strengths. We have a lot of strengths. We are, we have opportunity for, we have lots of opportunity for students to be creative and collaborate. We have, um, we can, when we went to map our spring courses, we were able to be very intentional in how we mapped it to a standard. And, in, and some of the times, we were able to redesign the course so that it included more digital skills. So we would say, instead of just an interview, how about we record the interview, edit the interview, post it on a wiki where students can collaborate and discuss it on, on the wiki. So we're able to, to see where our strengths are. Can you do the next one? We're also able to uh, see where our, one of the things that we came back to was that we also had some deficits. We can see where things are not uh, being done very well. Um, we can see that we can improve that. For example, uh, 4B stood out to me, and that was on the last slide. Exhibit a positive attitude toward technology. It, we had almost a zero in the fall on that, and then by the spring we had three. And we had a good reflection with our group. What does that mean? Well, it's really hard to assess if somebody has a positive attitude. Are they smiling while they're taking no. notes? <laughs> we're not sure. So although we don't want to get rid of that, that objective, it's hard to uh, evaluate it with on Moodle. So what we're going to try and do is look at our anecdotal evidence and see if we can find positive reflections in our critical thinking and apply that. And in the spring, we were able to actually define and uh, include that in spring courses. Um, some of the other things that we found were, were uh, like uh, number seven, we think maybe we could combine reflective thinking into, into uh, one or two. So we went through the rubrics of the uh, courses and we said, you know, there's some things that we can see that we're reaching each objective, but we can't actually see how we're reaching, how well we're reaching, how deeply and richly activities are reaching it in Moodle because all you can do is track the content and it's a click in a report. Mm -hmm. So what we developed was this rubric where we are looking at how much more clearly um, each course each course activity is. If it's developing, it's something that's very basic. It's very teacher guided. It's very um, software specific. As, as the skills progress, the activities get to be more, people can be more competent. They can choose the tool. They can have more choices in the template. And then finally, in the exemplary, it's, it's absolutely student driven. So we think that this is an opportunity that we can, here's an example where we mapped uh, on a large rubric each activity. What a great discussion point because uh, I sat with Nancy one day and we said, well, I, I'm doing mm, beginning websites. We're, we're just, just, just beginning. And she said, well, mine's developing. I'm doing HTML coding for so I said, wow, that's, that's impressive. I think that's more competent. So good discussions about where our things fit together. So this is a good snapshot. Can you go to the next one? All right, so finally, this is graph shows uh, our level of mastery in the 10 courses, and we can see the developmental levels. Um, this, we can see that our activities are truly a building block. We can see that our courses are building upon each other in, in incremental ways, and, and we can 
project where, where a student could be in the end. So by taking courses in, with the DL standard supply that could be in the minor or not in the minor, it would, we hope that by the time the student graduates, they will have many, many opportunities to have learning, uh, digital learning skills. So that's what we're seeing. And I think we, uh, there are things that we can note. Um, first of all, for example, we're doing beginner uh, one classes beginning to do video editing. And as they progress, it's very simple and it's very structured and it's in a very specific format. But as they progress to the 200, 300, 400 level classes, we can see that, that they'll have many opportunities to make it exemplary. Some of the things that we need to know are that some courses are for freshmen. Uh, for example, this FYE one, it's, it's the beginning FYE seminar, this the freshman seminar, and those things will always be developmental. We never expect to have anything exemplary in those freshman basic courses. So we're okay with that. Uh, some of the things we also want to know is uh, we aren't yet able to track fall to fall and spring to spring. We don't have enough data, but we have a baseline now, and now we have something we can track in the future. What we want to see is people's involvement in this and saying a, ch a shift in the teaching paradigm and possibly including things that have more digital learning at a higher level. So, for example, one English teacher decided she would, at the end of her term research paper, instead of doing a PowerPoint, she assigned an infographic, which required students to collaborate, uh, find credible sources, create a visual that was uh, at, at the point at the heart of the research paper. And so she's hitting on a lot of the digital learning standards that she could then map in her courses. So now uh, Anid's going to talk a little bit about mapping it in the humanities. Okay. So I had the advantage um, of mapping a course fall to spring um, called Understanding Digital Communication. And for those of you who may know that that is the foundational course in the digital studies minor. So my job was a little easier because already that course was aligned really nicely with many of the digital learning student learning outcomes. But in the first few offerings of the course, I really found myself focusing on the technology, okay? So the tools. And uh, so when I looked back, and to Annie's point, when I tried to retrofit some of these student learning outcomes to previous offerings of the course, I realized that because I was so focused on the technology and teaching the technology, I was missing out on a lot of these other learning outcome opportunities. So what I did is then I looked at the outcome and as I planned for the future offering of the course, I was able to either add new wrinkles to existing assignments that would address some of these other student life learning outcomes or create all new you know, opportun learning opportunities. So I want to take you through just three examples of assignments that I mapped in this particular course. The first course was a course that, uh, or uh, the first assignment was a Googleography. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this before, but it's a really fun opportunity. So in my uh, DL150 course, I require students to keep a blog. And so one of the first blog posts that they do is they have to do a Googleography. This is a 200 word post in their blog that essentially is a biography of themselves. Now, there's one catch. They can only use information they find in Google, all right? So they can search their name, their family's names, their everyday activities, right? But the catch is they can only use what they find. What does this teach them? Well, it was really interesting for me because it allowed me to infuse information fluency, right, in a way that wasn't dull or considered dull, you know, uh, but, but it's still a really important part of becoming a, a global citizen. Uh, students quickly noted that the information on Google was outdated, incorrect, and created you know, an incomplete picture of who they were. Um, and so what we focused on was that the computers have a lot of information, right? But it requires a human to create a narrative. It requires a human to make sure that that information is credible or current. And so I was able to incorporate that information literacy in a way that was a lot of fun, actually. Um, the second uh, activity, and this is actually an in-class activity that we did, was uh, a module on terms and conditions. So we all know what terms and conditions are, right? The 300-page document written in nine-point font, you know, a font that's terrible to read on the screen that everyone just 
scrolls to the bottom, clicks the box, and agrees, right? Because you can't use the tool unless you agree. So students have their whole life, essentially, agreed to these terms and conditions without reading these documents. So I showed them this very interesting case study from this British organization um, called Game Nation. And Game Nation, as a little April Fool's joke, rewrote their terms and conditions. And they incorporated an immortal souls clause, okay? <laughs> and so on April Fool's, they gathered about 75,000 souls, okay? Now, was there really a consequence here? No. But it was an excellent lesson for my students because it showed them that if you don't read what you're agreeing to, you have no idea what you're agreeing to. And this led to a much more relevant conversation. Then we dissected Instagram. Terms and conditions. Okay, because I know they're all using Instagram. They've already all agreed to the terms and conditions. What's in there? Well, do you know that when you agree to Instagram's terms and conditions, they own your photos and they can do whatever they want with your photos? Like jaws dropping, okay? Um, very important learning lesson for my students. And so I didn't expect them to go to their phones and delete the Instagram app, right? But what it did do was it made them more conscientious consumers, more critical consumers of digital media. And so next time they go to click on that terms and conditions box, they're going to be a little more thoughtful about what they're agreeing to. Um, and so that was a way for me to incorporate digital citizenship and encourage them to become lifelong learners when it comes to digital media um, throughout, their, you know, throughout their, their life. An existing assignment that I did, this HTML and CSS, and CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, project was an existing project I had in my course. And it required students to create a four-page website in quotations because they use Notepad, right, as a sort of a sandbox to test HTML and CSS. And it's more of an assignment on critical thinking, reflective thinking, um, critical thinking problem solving. But what I did do is after I went back and reviewed the student learning outcomes, I realized that I wasn't doing enough reflection, enough, enough evaluation. So after students created their four-page website, they were then required to beta test that website with a peer. Okay, hands off, let them look at it, let them navigate it, see where the problems are, right? This was very reflective. On top of that, I required them to do an in-class presentation to talk about the challenges and the successes along the way and what they learned throughout the process. So I was able to keep this, this uh, project, which I thought was a really effective project, but make it much more meaningful and make it align with additional student learning outcomes. So this course for me has been um, really, uh, it's been really appropriate and informative in terms of mapping these assignments, but I had the added advantage of doing it in a liberal arts course in the humanities tied to digital studies. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Laurel Hester, who's had a little bit of a different experience. So uh, the course that I'm gonna to talk to you about is human biology, and this is a course, that actually, it actually has a sophomore standing prerequisite, but it's part of our general education curriculum, so it, uh, the students from uh, many different divisions, many different majors uh, that are taking this course often as a requirement to kind of check off the natural sciences. And so I already was using Moodle as a tool fairly heavily to give students who have a little bit of science anxiety some kind of additional practice in the sciences. And so last year uh, in our a talk, um, I discussed a bit my use of uh, Moodle, these Moodle topic pages and these study forum posts, which I use in this class and actually in some other classes as well. And so those are examples of existing assignments that I was able to go back and then kind of tag in Moodle as hitting some of our uh, student learning outcomes for digital learning. Uh, this year when I taught this course, partly coming out of my experience uh, interacting with people thinking about the digital learning minor, I uh, modified or uh, some previously existing assignments or added uh, several new assignments that hit different areas of digital learning. But because my main focus in this course really is to communicate science content, the digital learning stuff really, you know, it was only if it really could serve the um, purposes of the course in terms of the content that it seemed appropriate to me. But as I found myself looking for these student learning outcomes, it actually 
let me see ways in which adding the digital learning component could really strengthen the course and strengthen the students' understanding of the course and how it might help them become lifelong learners kind of in the area of uh, human biology. So I'd like to talk to you about a couple of these assignments and how that, fit in, that fits in. So I'm gonna start with talking about the um, Moodle glossary. So I had actually, one of the challenges in this course is the vocabulary, and I always handed out vocabulary sheets and asked students to write definitions uh, for selected words on exams. And, but this year what I did is I actually used Moodle and had everyone for each unit had to pick a term off that vocabulary sheet and then post uh, a glossary term. And so over on the left, I include a little subset of my directions for that assignment. And what I found is I think this helps students instead of really focusing on, okay, I need to know these words to think about how do I look up words and get information about you know, a word that is unfamiliar to me that is related to human biology. And so this is just an example of one student's posting. One thing that I did find in, in this that I knew to some extent from previous experience with some of my other Moodle activities is I found it was very important to explicitly sometimes give directions even for very simple skills like hyperlinking. And it also really helps if you explicitly tie that skill to a point, even if it's a very small amount of point in the assignment. And by doing that, if you can get students to insert pictures or hyperlink appropriately, of course, it increases the chance that other st students will use that as a resource in their own studying. So um, the other thing that uh, this is a nice example of, I guess, now in my course, is I think it's really important both within a course and also across the curriculum to have multiple opportunities. I'm sure many of you have found that sometimes students are not as good at transferring information from one course to the other. And so having those repeated opportunities to attempt to skill uh, and maybe get the feedback of a point off because you didn't hyperlink it appropriately or whatever, and then um, try it again. So in my course, there are actually at least three required times when they have to hyperlink something and more than nine total opportunities you know, on different assignments for students to uh, practice that skill. Okay. So the next assignment I want to uh, talk about is actually one that was inspired by my attendance at this conference last year because I attended Leslie Skousen's workshop on enhancing content for mixed skill classroom and she talked about this cool Padlet, which I then took back and just tried out a little bit in my fall classes. Um, and, and in my role actually as one of these technology learning mentors, I shared this tool with somebody else in my division who actually also tried it out and kind of in other ways that uh, kind of got me to think even more about the potential uses of this tool. And that actually led to um, Mary and Jackie, my colleague, and me presenting in our fall digital learning week. Uh, and so this QR code is actually a link to the handout that we provided with some thoughts about how you might use this tool in classes. And so then I was ready this spring to take the step of actually making, using this Padlet kind of a regular part of my teaching. And so on a weekly basis, I had students uh, use Padlet. And here too, I had actually previously always had some sort of question, like in this one about stem cells, and what I would do is I would hand out index cards and have people you know, write down their thoughts, and then we would have a discussion. But the great thing about using the digital tool here is, one, it's easier to quickly share a diversity of opinion, and again, it moves a little bit more from the individual kind of mastery of a skill for a course to thinking about, okay, you know, how do I find pictures that help explain some difficult concept to me or find websites and what am I thinking about those websites? How do I share them? How do I hyperlink them? 
Um, it allows people to share their opinions anonymously on a sensitive topic, which uh, can be really nice. And I actually found I got a much greater diversity of opinion on a tough topic. And it really helped me move my course in a way that helped the students, I think, see the relevance. So I could talk about how, you know, this is a topic where as voters, you may be asked to make some sort of a decision. And so I found it to be a really kind of positive interaction with colleagues, with my experience here, uh, and was kind of pushed a little bit to take that step into using it by thinking about these student uh, learning outcomes. So the last uh, project that I want to talk about is I also took the step this year of in the past I done a, write a letter to editor assignment and so I this year for the first time I tried doing a video project and I was a little nervous about it there were a few technology glitches along the way I was I was very so really all the things I do in my class are at that developing level because my class focus is on teaching the biology content. I feel like I can't spend the time to really teach video editing or anything. But students are kind of excited about these skills. And I actually did have, even at the sophomore level, students in my class who said they had never made a video. So these are not digital learning minors. These are you know, anyone across the curriculum. One of the challenges I found in terms of making a rubric, of course, is so I had these kind of DL related categories uh, that are shown here. But of course, that's only a small part of what the purpose of the project is. So down here, kind of some of the more biology related categories. And this gets back to something Annie was talking about, which is that when you look in Moodle, so like I can tag, I've tagged this as being one of the things that hits one of our student learning outcomes. But, um, you know, obviously, like the grade on this assignment is not really going to reflect anything about a student's mastery of digital learning because the grade on this assignment uh, incorporates a lot of biology information, really almost more than it does the digital learning. That said, I think that for students, it often made them feel like this course that they're required to take it was more relevant to their lives because they were learning a skill or getting that push to use a skill that they were, you know, they were thinking, oh, I could use this in another course, or uh, I could use this uh, at home, you know, to make a video, and now they had increased confidence in just being able to do this with, because it was at the development, developing level, I had very low stakes as far as quality of my video itself. And uh, so I really found that uh, as a faculty member whose primary interest is in the subject content area, that there were really nice interactions from having these student learning outcomes that pushed me to make my course a better course and make it more relevant to students and let them see more what are kind of these lifelong learning goals that when I get out of this course, then if I have a medical problem or something, I have the confidence to evaluate websites or find vocabulary uh, and um, you know, to kind of take that forward in my life. So I'll hand it back to Nancy too. So uh, these are some of the resources and um, external, both internal and external outreaches that we've made. And um, so in wrap up for our portion, and then we want to hear from you, is uh, we're growing it. It's incremental in its progress, but it is growing. Uh, faculty adoption is happening incrementally. Um, but we're working on uh, developing buy-in, uh, and we want to make sure that this is not an additional layer, uh, as uh, Laurel really points out uh, quite well, that you know, faculty do not need to get uh, additional workload to make digital learning happen, and that's one of our challenges. 
And before I do turn it over to you, I'd also like to give a big thanks to the organizers for the Bryn Mawr Conference. We're a small institution uh, attending this conference. Has uh, the reflection has been uh, great and very generative in preparing for this, and so we're appreciative of the opportunity. 